Hey guys, welcome back to pre-production. Thank you so much for listening once again. I am here with a wonderful guest. He's got a film out that he directed with his brother called Talk To Me from A24 right now. It's an excellent horror film. If you haven't seen it, please do check it out. I'm sitting here with Danny Filippo. Thank you so much, man, for coming on. It's so nice to have you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm. A, I was just saying, I'm a subscriber, so it's. Uh, this is very cool. <laughs> well, thank you, and, man. Uh, and I know that you're doing your film as well, so I, I'm so curious to hear about that whole process as well. A little bit. I just wanted to, yeah, hear some stories a little bit too. But I don't know if we could do that on this podcast. But yeah, you curious. can do whatever you want, man. Anything. Uh, my this is a free, safe space. Talk about anything you want to talk about. Talk to Me is a movie that I heard a lot about. Uh, a producer friend of mine saw it at a festival early on, and he immediately called me afterwards and was like, this is going to be one of the biggest horror films of the year. It's so good. It's very scary. It's exciting. It's different. Uh, great performances. And he couldn't shut the fuck up about it, to be honest. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was pretty I was pretty hyped to see it, and uh, it didn't disappoint. You know, I'm a big horror fan. I see everything. To see Talk To Me and have it be... The theater was packed, too. And, and I don't live in a big town. I live in a small town in Ohio. And people were really, really into the film. You could see... You, I could, like... I always sit in the back, and so I can kind of yeah. see everyone's heads and, and the movement of, like, the way people kind of, like, react to things. And they were jumping at all the right parts, and, you know, it was just really fun to see. So congratulations, first of all. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I've uh, just bought tickets now to my local cinema, which is Hoyt's Tea Tree Plaza in South Australia. And um, it's always, um, yeah, been my dream to like walk into the cinema and see my poster on the wall, which is so, so sick. So like, I'm, I'm so excited to sit down and watch it with that audience and just sit yeah, in the back corner and um, yeah, just uh, experience it with an audience. Because we've been, we've been doing these um, premieres as well, like around the world, like we've been like um, flying from country to country and, it, and, and every single time. It's so funny that the, the different reactions, like some beats obviously hit every single time, but there's, I remember we're in Montreal and there's a, um, <laughs> well, there was just more laughter than screams. Like they were loving it and laughing at the most insane moments, <laughs> which was, yeah, that was a different reaction, which is exciting hearing, hearing different reactions around the world. Yeah, it's it's really strange for me because um, you mentioned right now that I'm I'm kind of like in post on my movie and uh, I'm at that stage now. We're locked. We've locked picture and we're we're getting like final VFX in and the scores coming in and I'm working on the sound design next week and so it, we're really at the end of the road now. But we're starting to finally like you know the picture lock process. We started showing it to people and kind of getting reactions and and the you know like you said there were always these these points that were like inflection points where everyone would would be like that's amazing that's great that's good and then it'd be these other points that are that vary where it's like that didn't work or that did work and it, it's really fun to see how a film affects people because it's your baby for so long and it's yeah. in your head for so long and it's part of your like being in consciousness and then you have to give it away and see how other people <laughs> react to it um, but in, in your case, you know, I mean, it, oh, very horrifying for sure. But in your case, clearly people are reacting positively. So that's, that's great. Yeah. It doesn't stop the cringe though. And, and moments when you're like, uh, sort of like suffering in the seat, like it does happen a lot where you're sort of sitting and cringing. Even if the audience is being really responsive, there's something about it being on the screen and people watching it and judging it. That's, uh, horrifying every single time. And it's still, it's still an odd thing. And then you release something that's so personal as well. And then you're just watching yeah, the backs of all these heads watching the screen, and it's the most surreal, exhilarating but horrifying experience. And uh, yeah, that that first screening that we had at Sundance was like we were like, man, wanted to die in in that scene. Like it was such a hard thing to watch with everyone, and um, because we knew that so many, uh, you know, like Age Twenty Four was there, critics were there for the first time, and Ari Aster was there, and all these people were there, and then uh. It, like someone was just walking out and going to the toilet and as, they, as the door opened this light would spill in and fill the entire cinema and I'm like oh my god what you're ruining the experience and then they come back in they open the light it was called no one cared except for us it was of like course. it was painful and, and, and when they got up for a second like be, be honest when you saw that person get up for a second we were like oh my god they're walking out yeah literally well, I was just like they're bored like I'm like how could for 90 minutes you can't hold it there this, this, this sucks this movie sucks like yeah of course there was always the responses <laughs> yeah yeah I've, I've had the same issues uh, and obviously I haven't been through yet what, what what you have already with the release um that's that's to to be continued but the idea of like I showed the movie to my wife for the first time the rough cut and she has a story credit on the film her and I worked on the story a few years ago and, and kind of just crafted it together every time she made a noise 
or even shifted in her seat. I was like, hey, what's wrong? What, is, is it bad? Like, it, it, you know, like she would, yeah. if there was like a scene and I'd be like side, I look looking at her at the side of my eye, like how is she going to react to this? If she didn't react probably like, oh fuck, it's terrible. I got to recut it. You know, it's just like, it's really, yeah. truly, it, it's, it's probably more anxiety than we really need to have about things. I really do think that good filmmakers feel that way all the time. I don't really know any filmmakers who are truly great at what they do that are just supremely confident at all times. I feel like everyone who's great at making a film does have that you're your own best critic feeling all the time. That's why Talk to Me is good, though, because you guys cared about it. You didn't like you weren't pandering to an audience. You didn't dumb down the storytelling. The, the focus was always on character and you know the depth of like the lead and everything that went on with her past and and how she lost her her parent and all of that made the movie like really strong and then you also have the cool hand and what it does and so you know you guys definitely got the memo of how to make a good horror movie which of course is you tell a compelling story and then add the genre stuff yeah yeah and then and on that point it's just um always to make sure that the film even if it's a genre film is working on that drama level is the most important thing and to feel connected to the characters and, and um, have them ha have have elements of them that make them gray, you know, and not having everyone be so black and white was um, a big thing for us, especially with Mia. I, I like that some people really don't like Mia, you know, and and they're sort of angry at, at her, and those reactions are like, oh, she feels like a real person. How did you approach your writing process? Like, well, how did you break down or start? How did you crack the story? Was it characters first? Was it like moments first? What how, what was your in? The way I kind of approach writing is usually I, I think about a concept, something that could be intriguing to me to watch. And then I immediately start thinking of a character that could be involved in said concept that I would want to sort of like experience that concept through. But sometimes it changes. Sometimes a whole movie just smacks me in the face. I remember I was driving down the road and I saw roadkill on the side of the road. It was like a dead raccoon or something. And I got this whole story based off that, and I immediately ran home and started writing it. So it's weird, you know? Like, it just kind of happens. It, I, I can't, like, quantify it. I know. Like, I didn't always get into a certain headspace before I wrote. And so I would I would spend, like, a few days of, like, I would never be awake during the day. I'd only be awake at night. I'd be going for walks, having headphones, and doing anything I could to scare myself into, like, a... It'd be, like, a, a weird, yeah, mental state. And then I'd be walking, having conversations with myself, and it would always start from those, like conversations i feel like were like a big in for me we're like uh what are they talking about and how these characters are interacting so i, I, I that was always the thing I, I could never sit down and just start writing it would always be getting in the headspace for a couple of days and then suddenly it just explodes out of me and i'll just be yeah, writing you know for like a couple of days and it's like um yeah it's so odd and then when i try to force it it just doesn't happen like okay so it's not that's impossible to force the creativity and it's also impossible to balance writing on top of other things like if i had a meeting during the day or a zoom call during the day or anything then i'm like i'm not going to be able to write today i'm just not going to be in the headspace for it. like i have to really be isolated <laughs> yeah we both have roots in youtube yeah. and i hope that when my film comes out i can start doing that you know full time where did you first kind of discover film and where did you start thinking about it as a potential career it was so, so young. Like, it was, it was literally nine years old when we made our first movie. It's so funny, I'm finally in Adelaide and I've got them here. There was this thing that we did, did called The Evil Flamingo. And there was, like, a bunch of these films that we did, which was, like, it's so ridiculous. Like, these oh, are, wow. uh, yeah, yeah. So, and then we had, Wonderful. like, Evil Flamingo 2. Oh, I, I love the parental <laughs> advisory warning. Yeah, we used to love the rating system and everything. And, like, we, I used to be so obsessed with the ratings. The fourth one, which was, like fifth one the sixth one and we were just like so young doing it and then and then from there and like we did these evil flingo movies and we were just so obsessed and then we like we did this thing it's like here called to muffy and we did 10 seasons of this show oh my and it was like from like 13 to 18 or something like that we were so obsessed with um, this is wonderful and for the for the listeners uh he is showing me an incredible shelf filled with like actual like tapes and dvds with covers and everything of their films which is great <laughs> yeah yeah and, and then so for us it was always just, it was the only only thing that we were really in love with and loved expressing ourselves with and um it was our friend's older sister Tamani's older sister our best friend Tamani's older sister Nelly that was really nurturing and, and like um really helped us express that creativity and gave us 
someone to screen it to. So every weekend we'd make these episodes and screen it for her. And we'd have these movie nights and, um, you know, we just, she would give us advice and, and say when she was bored or what she didn't like and all that sort of stuff. And then I remember on the fourth season of this show, we were really obsessed with green screen and VFX. And our dad like converted our entire garage into a green screen for us. And then um, she hated it. She was like, this is so lame. Like when I'm sitting here watching people in front of the screen, and then so she really was shooting on the green screen. And even that's still really instilled with me. Where I'm like, I hate, like, I hate VFX too. Is that <laughs> so in like, one experience? Yeah. 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 And then, yeah. So, I, but it was also good to say, you just learn by doing it and by making stuff and crafting stuff. You just, your skills can't help but get better. And so, like, my advice to anyone is always to just start and just start making stuff and you'll improve of every single thing that you do. And then, if you're further along, like the next step, once you have a script, is always to find a producer, is the most important step as well, is to really find, a producer that has those connections and has that um, that experience to take your film to the next level and the next step. Even with brief, brief script notes and finding financing, like I'm just so not business minded at all. So that part of it, I'm such a, you know, I'm so dumb to, I'm so dumb to anything except for making stuff. And that, that was what was really fun this year is also learning the other side of filmmaking where it's like about distributors and, and all, all that side of thing and like um, how that all works. Cause I was so new to that too. It is, it is strange. I mean, I, I remember one of those first kind of times where I, I had like a quote unquote legal discussion about a movie of like, you got to sign this, you got to, you got to, you know, you have to make sure it goes to these territories and stuff. And I'm like, what do you territories like te the rights of where it goes and how you sell it here to this, this country and this country might be different and you got to make sure you do this. And it's just so crazy. Before I made a film, I always wondered what a producer actually does. You know, like, because I, I would ask, what does a producer do? I know what a writer does. I know what a director does. I know what an actor does. But a producer is wearing so many hats. And, and one of those things I now know is that they know all of that stuff that I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's okay that I don't know that, you know, it's and I think that that's like really freeing also to accept that, too, of, of just the, like you're going to learn things. There's going to be times where you say, like, you know what, I don't know the answer to that. And then also, I, I, um, our producer was a creative producer as well. So uh, her script notes were so incredible. And she used to be a script editor before a producer, which is really awesome. And she is so, I feel so safe with her. I'm like, we're initially going to make this of a Hollywood studio. And then, yeah, their creative notes were like really, really turned to feel a bit more typical or something. Like they weren't necessarily bad notes at all, but I, I was like, oh, I, I know these beats. These feel familiar to me, too familiar. And I, I wouldn't be feel comfortable writing or directing it. Like I don't. I'm not connecting to it. Um, and so she made us feel really sure about not going with them and doing it independently and then raising the money that way. She she was even amazing on set to remind us of certain beats if we need to. And she was like, she would come in when we finished all our edits and give her notes. Like she's so hands-on. And, and so she has such a deep cinematic brain, you know, and all, like her knowledge of cinema is so deep as well. So to have someone like that, uh, I have like a rock like that is very important. I think for every, any creative is to find a producer that you trust more than yourself. Yeah, I completely agree. And another thing that you mentioned there that I think is really important for people to hear is that you took notes. You actually, yeah. you took notes and there's a lot of people that don't, they find notes insulting and you Crazy. know, <laughs> you know, yeah. usually that's, that's where you get into those the bad movie territories. People who like, no, my vision, my way or the highway. But um, yeah. anybody's idea in the room can be the best idea. I think that that collaboration and the collaborate, like um, that's the one of the most beautiful parts about filmmaking is to have all these artists in the same room with you. And and it was always about finding the heads of departments that I really really looked up to that I trusted more than myself. Where I was like, I want to hire a cinematographer that's achieve, achieving stuff that I could never accomplish on the camera by myself. Or you know, I, I'm trusting the script editor whose opinion I know. She has more experience and, and when she's saying something, it's not saying something just to say something. Sometimes I will send a draft and she'll have barely any notes. So I know that when those notes do come in, I'm not going to be like, yeah, yeah. I, I have to really listen to trust. And then also uh, another cheat code that I had was my brother, Michael, like his notes are very good as well. And he was very brutally honest if things were boring or if they were shit. And like, you need someone that does, isn't worried about hurting your feelings. I can really just say like, my brother tears my scripts to pieces. Like, and would like completely always roast them. And like, even with these new scripts that I'm writing, I'm so bored. What the fuck is this? Like, that's like he would like, <laughs> but you sort of need that. Like, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you need that honesty. It, um, 
if you know it's brutal, it's you need someone to say it if it needs to be said. <laughs> Absolutely. At some point, you guys started YouTube, obviously, and uh, yeah. we're very we're very successful on YouTube. And um, I, I would love to know if if you ever felt similar similarly to how I do at times, which was obviously filmmaking was your goal. Yeah. And you know, you were making stuff all the time on YouTube. It's not like you weren't making anything, but. Did you ever at some point begin to feel like, ah, oh, you know, this is not happening. I really need to make a movie. I really need to get make a film for theaters. And did that ever sort of conflict with trying to balance figuring out how you can stop doing YouTube full time all the time, you know, being regular and consistent and getting the monetization to come in? Yeah, I, I know that like um, the money thing was never a, a thing for us because we'd never really made any money off of YouTube. Like our videos are always getting demonetized and everything. So <laughs> I, I, I would look at my friend's paychecks who would get like a fraction of my views. I'm like, you're making more than me. What the fuck? I, I like, you know, every dollar that we ever made, we'd always put right back into the films and the videos and just made those the best that they could be. And I, I think eventually I, I just felt like I, I wasn't expressing myself properly on the platform. Like I felt scared to just have two people sit down and talk. Like I could never do that in a YouTube video. I'd always have to add in an explosion or a scream or let's break something. Like I was always scared of alienating my audience or not not giving them what they wanted. And so I felt at a bit of a distance. Like I really liked the stuff they were making. I had so much fun making it, but I had the urge to be more personal and tell stories where I will feel comfortable sitting and having characters just sit in a bedroom and talk. You know, I, I was, um, that's what I was excited about. I was excited by it to be able to uh, flex that creative muscle, not flex, but like to practice that or to explore that. Cause I hadn't done that. I remember I would shot and directed a short film called Deluge, which is about a father and son in a suicide cult. And that was right before YouTube. And then when YouTube came up, everyone's like, Oh, you should upload Deluge. And I was like, I'm so scared to upload this to my channel. Like I have like my audience, like, what the fuck is this? Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I knew that I was, I felt like I, it was time and I was ready and I, I wanted to do it more than anything. And so it was like taking those last couple of dollars that we had and moving out to LA. And that's when we started trying to really shop the script and just taking brand deals and making the YouTube videos, like just to be able to sustain ourselves and be able to live out there just to try and get the script picked up and, um, Oh, yeah, it was, it was really scary. Yeah, it's horrifying, especially, yeah, it's like um, to take that step away. And then, yeah, if you're making a film, that is going to take all your time and focus and you won't have the time to really put the effort into the YouTube stuff. So you can see the quality maybe dip during those uh, months as well. And the audience recognizes it too, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes. They're like, what the fuck was this? You used to do this. And it's like, exactly. I'm trying to do something else right now. Yeah. I know. I uh, trust me, man. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Everything you said to me, it was like looking at a mirror, man. I mean, it was like <laughs> I completely, yeah. I completely understand <laughs> a lot. For me, you know, it, it became about like, all right, if I'm going to keep doing this YouTube thing, I still find enjoyment in it. Talking about films and it, it's extremely fun. I just have to, I had to kind of pivot away from being negative. You know, a couple of years ago, I was like, I'm not doing any more negative movie reviews. If I see a film I don't like, I'm just not going to talk about it. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's the only way that I could like be a filmmaker while also talking about films online. I would have to pivot towards being fully supportive. I think that's a, a, an interesting part of the YouTube stuff of being in there for so long is, is growing as a person and maturing as a person as well. Something else that I, I, I love about your journey in particular is that a lot of people have characterized you guys as YouTubers turned filmmakers, which is, I guess, true in a way, but I don't really think so. I mean, people are going to say the same thing about me, but I feel like I've been a filmmaker since I was a kid. Like, yeah. the perception is that we started on YouTube and now we are filmmakers. But, like, I think in your brain, you've probably been a filmmaker for a long fucking time. It's just that now you finally got something made. I, I always classified myself as a wannabe filmmaker. <laughs> like I always was like, I always was like, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. And then even when I was on set, I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> and then, like, so I always felt like I like, I want to be, I still feel like, um, I feel like, oh, I'm making stuff. I'm expressing myself. And these videos, I don't look at as videos or content. I am looking at them as short films, yeah. you know, uh, so that's where the, I sort of look at those, but I still have this weird thing where I'm like, I'd be scared to call myself a filmmaker even now. It's a, um, a a weird thing, yeah. I'm the, I'm the uh, same way. I get it. I had a really great conversation with a writer on this show a few months back. His name's Brian Edward Hill. He's, he's he's done a lot of comics and he's written some scripts and gotten some made. He's really really talented. But he said this great thing 
you don't really think of yourself as a thing until other people call you the thing. Right, right. You know? Yeah. You don't think of yourself as a pro anything until other people come up to you and are like, oh my God, you're this. Can you please tell me how to be that? I need to know how to be that. And you're like, whoa, I guess I, I guess I did it. In my opinion, that's a sign of a great filmmaker though, because there's a lot of humility there. Anytime I ever met a filmmaker that thinks they're like the shit, I'm like, would you, would you just <laughs> shut up, man? Like, would you just, I, yeah. I can't stand it. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I I um I, I wonder so for your for your process what what have you found the most stressful part of of the whole filmmaking process was it the writing the editing or the shooting what what's been the most fucked up for you traumatic traumatic so I think there were two days on set where the weather was a major problem for us we had a lot of exteriors in the movie and there was one day the weather was actually amazing for almost the entire shoot but there was one day where we were shooting in an abandoned amusement park we had only one day to shoot there and it's a real abandoned amusement park so there's roller coasters and ferris wheels and stuff just sitting in the woods it's really cool i was like this is the day this better work otherwise we're gonna have some problems and of course, the entire day leading up to this night shoot, it was raining and pouring for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Uh, it was very scary. We only had the one day there. And it was like, if we don't get it now, we're going to have to figure out how to do a pickup day later, which is going to cost us, you know, whatever, $50,000 or something. So that's a lot of money on an indie film. And leading up to the shoot, we were all there. All of our gear was in plastic. You know, it was covered from the rain and we were just sitting underneath a tent eating our breakfast at midnight, you know, because it was a night shoot, and and just being like, please stop raining. You know what I mean? Oh. <laughs> um, I was checking the weather every two seconds just to look at, like, the blob of rain that was passing over, just praying that it starts to lower and go away from where we were. And I kid you not, 10 minutes before we were scheduled to shoot, it started to dissipate a little bit. The rain started to die down. And we were able to do it. Now, the thing that, of course, was a challenge was there was mud everywhere, which was really hard on the crew. But it actually resulted in a really beautiful looking scene because every single ride in this park was wet. Yeah. And so it was everything was glistening and everything was shiny and it looked beautiful. And it looked like we spent like a hundred thousand dollars on this set. You know what I mean? So it kind of yeah. worked out. But for like five hours there, I was biting my my fingers off well you know i was i, I remember um for us we we were always keeping youtube in mind even when we were on set so we actually flew someone out that recorded every single day of behind the scenes of talk to me wow. and i was like film everything every argument every single part of production film everything and so he literally was getting six to seven hours of footage a day of every single day of set and um my, my brothers edited them into each week of production is its own video. So there's five weeks, so five videos that break down each week of production. And um, so we've got that at the moment. And I'm a bit nervous to release that as well because we're a bit rogue, you know, like uh, it's, it wasn't run like a normal film set at times. Like my brother and I have like a weird energy. And, and, <laughs> so I was wondering if that's going to translate or if people look at that and be like, what the fuck is this? I, I, um, I feel like people will love that though. I mean, like uh, we had the same thing. We had a we had a BTS uh, person on our film set. We had that as a perk for our Kickstarter campaign was that people could actually like watch a mini documentary once or about once a week or so. Uh, which was which was interesting because it, it does kind of keep you on your toes when somebody's right there like filming you and it felt like it was like this big budget film but it you know it really wasn't we shot it for eight hundred thousand dollars. Whoa! So that's you insane. Know. Yeah, I mean, we raised one point four million on the Kickstarter, but like immediately five percent of that went to Kickstarter, and then twenty percent of it went to managers who helped us run the campaign. So that goes down to like one point one immediately. So to save some money for post, we had to shoot it for 800K and the rest has been editing, score, visual effects. Yeah, that's so cool. And so do you think you eventually release that stuff on the YouTube, the Kickstarter stuff once the film's out? Yeah, I mean, like, so I think the goal is to, for the Blu-ray to have like all of that. Um, yeah. I really want to make like a great physical. I mean, I, I just saw your shelves. You clearly like physical media. Um, obviously behind me is a bunch of physical media. And so- I really want to like make great Blu-rays. If I if I can uh, be privileged enough to make more films, I want to have a lot of great like commentaries and 
featurettes and because when I used to get a DVD or a Blu-ray, it felt like it felt like purposeful. Like there's a reason I just dropped twenty five dollars on this because I can watch David Fincher on set of Zodiac for like two hours. There's like a great special feature that has all this stuff and commentary tracks, and I really miss that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what I found interesting in this Blu-ray process is that each of the different um, territories have their own versions of it. So we did a commentary track for the UK Blu-ray, but that won't be the commentary track that's on the US Blu-ray. So that, that's interesting because diff different um, uh, companies, like A24 bought the rights for North America, so they've got the, those American rights, but then the UK is a completely different distributor, so they've got their own Blu-ray and they're doing their own thing. Um, so I've been learning about that as well, which is, is, is very fascinating. We shot this um, um, this prequel to talk to me. I heard about that. Yeah. So, so, I, but it got miscommunicated. Like I, I'm, I'm really bad at saying things. So I was, <laughs> we shot this prequel that is completely told from the perspective of mobile phones that is following Duckett, who's the kid at the start of the film. Uh, right. it like, leads up to the opening of the movie, but it's just, um, social media videos that lead up to the opening of the film. And it shows him getting a hand, him experimenting, him losing his mind. Uh, these relationships that he's having, his fractured relationship with his brother, his, him losing his grandmother. And so we shot all this sort of stuff, him dealing with bullying. We shot about three months worth of videos that could be uploaded daily that led up to the release of the film was the plan. Um, but uh, some people felt it might market the film a little bit like it's a found footage film. So maybe the messaging would be a little bit complicated. So we sort of held back and then we just said, when the film's out, then maybe we'll release it. But we started releasing it and then automatically they're just getting removed <laughs> because uh, bullying, violence, oh. uh, this sort of, I'm like, okay, this prequel is not going to exist on the internet. It is impossible because I yeah, I, I was, yeah, I wasn't thinking about guidelines when I shot it. I was thinking about an exciting way for, to tell this story and just the story. And, can, that yeah, be, so, can that be put on the Blu-ray? For some reason, they've asked, and I, I feel like the mediums aren't right. For some reason, seeing it on the Blu-ray wouldn't be the same as just coming across it randomly on yeah. the internet. It's more exciting to me. So backtracking a little bit, the, the part that was really stressful for us was post. It was, the, it was specifically the music that was a really difficult thing. Like My brother is very hands-on with sound design and music. To the point where he'd be in on every single session saying, that's a DB too loud. Oh, I can tell you're manually writing that. Like driving the sound design are fucking crazy. It's like, Michael, let them have some sort of freedom. Oh my God. Like he was super, super <laughs> hands on in that, that side of it. Um, and so with the music, he'd actually edited together an entire temp score for the film. Um, with all these different um, soundtracks and different music from all these different, you know, sites or whatever. So he'd put it together and we'd given it to this composer and said, we really want it to be like this like we are literally edit editing to these beats it's sort of like a music video in some of these parts like we we need these beats being hit and so he's like yep leave it with me he went away for um two three four weeks and we're like are we gonna hear and we haven't heard anything yet and then we we're told you know he's a composer let him like let him do his thing let him trust his process and then when he delivered the score it was like oh my god this is not working at oh all. no yeah, this is the exact opposite. Like, th it's a completely different film. The film literally doesn't work with this music. And so it was really stressful because we got um, part of financed by this thing called the Adelaide Film Festival, which is our local film festival here in South Australia. And we have a premiere date already. We started shooting in February and we had to release it in October. So, and then people Holy already buy it. Yeah, the turnaround wow. was insanely tight. And a bunch of our budget had to go to COVID as well because of the COVID yep. measures. Yeah, it's crazy. The, yeah, things that you don't even think about, lawyer fees and all this sort of stuff. And then, yeah, that budget's just vanished. And yeah. so we're up against the clock. We're like, this movie needs to be, this score needs to be delivered in, you know, however, two months or whatever it is. And we don't, it's nowhere near done. And so my brother was going in every single, he would like sit in this sound suite doing the sound design and he would stay up all night working with this, sound editor to try and fix the, the the music and like he went overseas and was working in the house and it just it was not coming together and we had to make the decision to let that composer go and try and find a new one to compose the entire film within like two and a half weeks or something like that wow oh and so God. yeah and so it, like that was a time when my brother broke down crying in the sound suite where he was literally like oh my god people are going to come see this film and it's not ready and, and so we found this new composer, Cornell, and luckily he was a lifesaver. 
Like he took all those temp scores and was able to do his own spin on it. And somehow he put that score together in these like two and a half, nearly incredible, maybe three weeks. Like he, it was literally insane. Like I cannot believe he did it. And especially with the amount of notes that Mike was giving, because as I said, like Mike was relentless and very specific. Like he would like write up so many like, oh this, oh that's too like I, I like this key and this that like, and he would like tackle all those notes and do it and deliver a score that was better than the temp. You know, um, so that was insane. And what what would also it gave us room to do was to go through and really just focus on sound design. We're like, okay, the score's not working. Let's just focus on sound design and see how much sound design can carry the film. So we had that really strength. And then when the score came in, um, we were able to add that in as well. And what gave us the room for that as well was we'd pre-sold the film to so many territories at Khan's film market off of just a promo reel. We just edited together a little trailer. They said, don't expect anything because it's just the trailer and you guys are YouTubers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. Yeah. And so, but I feel what, that. there is a weird stigma, which is odd, but yeah. it is, it is absolutely. And it's funny, you know, I mean, first off, that's, that's horrifying, that story. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that, that's, that's an incredibly tight deadline. First off, February to October is crazy. Um, but to be that close and then have your score come in and be like, ah, oh, God, this is, I can't even imagine what that must have felt like listening to that. I mean, and just not connecting with it and knowing like this is in my gut, this is wrong. And what the fuck are we yeah. going to do? But I'm glad it worked out because the score is awesome. You know, I love the score for your movie. And so I'm glad that that worked out in the long run. But there is a weird stigma with YouTubers and making films. And I, it's funny because this is one of the, the last things I wanted to mention was that I feel like you and I were kind of part of one of the last generations that it's still a thing that a YouTuber gets to make a movie. Like people still comment on that. Cause I feel like 10, 15 years from now, I feel like every filmmaker that gets a movie made, like a young filmmaker, they the probably YouTube. had, yeah, they probably had a YouTube channel, you know? Exactly, yes. You know? Like if, if YouTube existed in the seventies, you fucking know Scorsese would have been uploading weird, like, you know, <laughs> like strange short films to YouTube. And and I don't even want to know, like if social media existed back then, what, what they would have been saying online. But, I do think that that's like, it's a stigma that is shifting. I saw it with um, like early on in my, my career as a film reviewer, it was very hard for me to get into press screenings or to get DVD screeners sent to me because I wasn't writing for an outlet. I wasn't part of New York times or whatever. And for them to, to eventually shift towards accepting video film reviews as a viable source of um, information where they could uh, let me have a reserve seat at screenings and send me DVD screeners. That was sort of like the industry acknowledging, okay, this is a new thing that we have to accept. I feel like we're, we're still quite not there though with filmmaking. Like it's like, you have to like have examples like you and your brothers, you know, or um, Joe Penna who made Arctic uh, with Mads Mikkelsen and Stowaway those he was also a youtuber and and you know people like that have to kind of like have that success for people to finally start looking at the platform of youtube and like tiktok and instagram as having viable artists who are striving to make content just in a short form who are really good at what they do they just haven't really been given that chance yet it's so yeah even when we spoke with george miller he said he directed Mad Max Fury Road. He said, I would 100% be uploading to YouTube if it existed when I was a kid. Exactly. There's no way they hit me. Yeah. Of yeah. course you got to find a place to upload the stuff that you're making. That makes no sense not to. And that's the thing where it's so odd because an artist is an artist, no matter what platform they're from or what they're uploading to. I've even, there was like one guy that does these Instagram shorts where I was like, oh my God, I know you're going to make an amazing film one day. And I can see it in, in what you're making and how passionate you are. And it's not, it doesn't feel like content content it feels like storytelling it feels yeah. like um yeah it feels separate and so yeah i i completely agree that in 10 years time it won't be this crossover thing everyone will have existed all the upcomers 100 percent will be coming from youtube yeah. or from some social media platform there's no way they don't and it's cool that that thing is slowly getting erased and that um to be at at this cross point is really exciting as well i just wonder because i know that when we're growing up we're always running the cinemas and we're like we want to be filmmakers we want to be but this generation, they want to be YouTubers or they want to be social media influencers is like the top job. Yeah. So I wonder what that crossover is going to be like for that next, next gen as well. Like um, those people that are 10 years old right now, I, there's no one growing up like, I want to make films. I, it, it'd it be very niche if it was like, whereas an influencer feels like the ultimate dream and the ultimate goal. Yeah. So I wonder how the landscape changes. 
Well, look, man, I mean, this was honestly wonderful to talk to you. Uh, your journey is so inspiring and you guys made a great film. And uh, also just as a parent of twins, it's nice to see two twins very successful and, uh, you know, like, you know, supporting each other and like working together and stuff. It gives me it gives me hope for my kids. Um, honestly, though, like, thank you for making a great movie. Thanks for supporting indie film. Thanks for being yet another successful YouTuber that went and did a movie that makes it just easier for me and the next person who wants to do that as well. Hell yeah. And yeah, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. It was, um, it was awesome. It was really cool. I, I yeah, I've watched you for, for a while. So it was really, um, yeah, an honor to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, man.